Thank you for being with us. We're ready for chapter 22 in the Revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the last chapter in the book. If you've been a part of the entire study, thank you for that as well. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Lord, thank you for the reading and hearing of your word. You have seen fit to write this love letter to us. A touch of your mind and your heart that enriches us and blesses us. We pray tonight for wisdom that we might hear your word and know you even better. Lord, we pray for those suffering right now from the virus, even those who have passed on to glory. Thank you for their example, the love we have gained from them. and the fond hopes we have of, of a heavenly reunion. As we read this account of heaven, warm our hearts and educate us that we might have consolation in the knowledge of your will as we learn your plan for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Evil's been destroyed. Satan has been thrown into the lake of fire along with the beast. And now we're in heaven. We saw last week the, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. We're going to go deeper now. We don't know much about heaven. Just little snippets is all God has let us know. Some people have theorized that if we were to know how wonderful heaven is, we might be in a hurry to get there. God has plans for us here on earth. And yet heaven is our destination. This is a picture, I'll tell you ahead of time, of Eden. God's original plan was for us to live with him in the Garden of Eden. Now, God has foreknowledge. He always knew we were going to sin. He always knew we were going to be kicked out of Eden. But this is his plan for us. It always has been. Before the creation of the universe, God intended for you to live with him in heaven forever. Now, there's some who won't. And we'll, we'll read a little bit about that. But this is our future. This is where our loved ones are now, in Jesus. It's the hope that makes a Christian strong. The pure river of water of life. Jesus told the woman at the well that if she would um, go to him, he could give her water that she'd never again thirst. Water is the giver of life. There's no life without it. The water from Jesus is living water. Now, the word living water technically literally means moving water. The idea was stagnant water is unsafe to drink. But it also means water that makes you alive. It doesn't poison you. It's health. It's full of health. In... Um, Chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, we're told, Now river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. So we're returning here to the Garden of Eden. By the way, the word paradise means a walled garden. No, nothing in that garden that you didn't plant. No animals in there to do harm. It's a safe, beautiful place. A lot of people have walled-in backyards or fenced-in backyards for that very reason. 
so they could sit back there and be at peace and, and just enjoy the surroundings of nature. And that is what the word paradise means. So we see a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. And where does it come from? Proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Our very sustenance comes from God. All that we have, all that we hope for comes from God. Verse 2, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Now, that's two trees. Some people theorize it's two rows of trees. But there's a tree, the tree, tree of life is on each side. Now, in the Genesis account, there was one tree. But here, there, the tree of life is two trees, one on either side of the river, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. So, four, 12 times a year, this tree, this tree bears fruit. It's always, it's always harvest time. It's always, that's a wonderful time for a farmer. When all this new food comes in. And the idea of getting, of it always being there every month is a picture of abundance and glory. And that's the picture here. We enjoy the blessings of God all the time. We don't have to can, we don't have to put up, we don't have to store. God's blessings in heaven are eternal and they're constant. The leaves of the trees, of the tree, were for the healing of the nations. Now, there are three things we need to live. We need water, we need food, and we need good health. All of that is supplied right here. We have everything we need to live. How are we going to live forever, you might ask? Because God is going to give us living water, eternal food, and good health. It's a sobering thought because we tend to judge people by their health. We respect people who are healthier and we look down on people, especially people with mental health problems. but there'll be no sickly in heaven. And I'll ask you, if you've been judging yourself as blessed because of your good health, your great intelligence, what are you gonna do when you get to heaven and nobody has a problem? I, su I submit to you there are people now of low intelligence or maybe even mental retardation who in their right minds in heaven might be far ahead of you. It's important to look into the heart to make sure that we have character because one day our intelligence is not gonna distinguish us. We're all gonna be perfectly healthy, mentally as well as physically. What are you doing about your heart, about your character, about your virtue? Those things are going to matter more. And there'll be, there shall be no more curse. What curse are we talking about? Well, in chapter 2 of Genesis, after Adam and Eve were found to have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God cursed the serpent, verse 14 in, in chapter 3 of Genesis. The Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than any beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall, this is talking about Jesus here. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Then he cursed the woman. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Pregnancy is going to become a hard time. Labor. Well, the name we give for giving birth to a child indicates that. Women love to look at men and nod their heads and realize that man is never going to understand real pain. In pain you shall bring forth children. Here's another curse. Your desire shall be for your husband 
and he shall rule over you. The reason women were placed under men is the curse of original sin, which, by the way, I would argue is taken away in salvation. If Jesus died for the sins of the world, Jesus died for that curse. Nevertheless, it is ended here in heaven. In the words, there shouldn't be no more curse. To Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Now, before they lived in a garden, an in, a walled-in garden. No danger, no problems, nothing. I remember as a child being able to play outside and run barefoot in the clover. Our backyard was covered in clover. And it was a joy to run around out there. My children have always lived in areas where we had sand spurs. And they don't know what it feels like to run barefoot through soft clover. We've never dared been able to do it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. You're never again going to just be able to pluck fruit and eat it. You're going to have to work hard all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. The idea that the ground will have to be worked. It will have to be, the weeds will have to be taken out constantly. And those weeds will not only be numerous, they'll be painful. Thorns and thistles. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. All the days of your life, you're going to eat this. This is your future. This is your curse. Now we're told in, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, and there shall be no more curse. With that original sin came death. The laws of entropy that say everything in the universe runs down came about because of original sin. Now there'll be no more death. No more getting tired. Imagine being able to run forever and never getting fatigued. Never getting sick. Never getting tired emotionally as well. No more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. You see, that's the reason there's no more curse is because we're with God now. We live with God. We're told that you can't look upon the face of the Lord or you'll die, but now in heaven we live face to face with God. And his servants shall serve him. Now again, I've mentioned a few weeks ago, most of us think of heaven as an eternal vacation. But the Bible is very clear. We're going to work. We're going to judge with Christ and we're going to serve God. He is going to put us to work. I don't know what that work is. But we will be part of the work of God forevermore. Verse 4, they shall see his face. As I said, we can live before the face of God now. And his name shall be on their foreheads. We belong to God. There will be no night there. Now, earlier we were told that the destruction of Rome will be so complete there won't even be one lamp burning. The utter darkness because of the destruction, contrast that with heaven, with Eden, where the new Eden, where there would never be a night. There's no need for a lamp because it never gets dark. And the creatures that run around in the dark won't be a part of our problem either. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. We will serve God forever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. Now the he who's speaking here is um, an angel, but he's a messenger. So we... 
we take what he says as the word of God, as the word of the Lamb, because he, he's speaking for them. You'll see in a minute why that's important. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. Notice how often God tells us something and then emphasizes it by saying, thus saith the Lord, or I am the Lord your God. He's making it sure because sometimes he tells us things that are so wonderful, we don't believe them. These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Now that word shortly can also be translated um, in a moment. Behold, he's speaking for Jesus, I am coming quickly. And that word also means in a, in a suddenly. It's important to note He's coming suddenly. There'll be no warning. If you're not already ready, it'll be too late. That's the warning he's giving. That's why he had to emphasize, I'm, this is true. Because he's saying, when I come, I'm going to be on top of you before you know it. Be ready or else. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, besides the intellectual content, what, what are the words of the prophecy? They're all focused on faithfulness. Being true to Jesus, not bowing down to Caesar, not bowing down to the Antichrist, not bowing down to evil. Hold on, repent, and stay pure. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. I'm putting my reputation on the line is what he's saying. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. He's so overwhelmed with an angel speaking in, in, in the place of Jesus that he's worshiping the angel as though he were Jesus. And he said to me, verse 9, see that you don't do that. For I am your fellow servant. Now we think of the angels as so far above us. But here he says, I am your fellow servant. We're on the same team. And of your brethren, the prophets. I'm a fellow servant of you, and I'm a fellow servant of your brothers, the prophets. Here he's making John, the beloved disciple, equal to the prophets. He's saying, John, the prophetic word you received is as important as the book of Isaiah or Jeremiah or any of the prophets. And of those who keep the words of this book, I'm also the fellow servant of every Christian, those who keep the words of the book. He's your fellow servant and mine. We work together. Worship God. Don't worship me. Worship God. How many people choose to worship angels? Well, you might laugh at that idea, but there are actually Christian groups that would pray to an angel, asking the angel to intercede for them. That is blasphemy. It is a sin to ask anyone to intercede for God on your behalf other than Jesus. Jesus sits at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding on our behalf. We don't need another intermediate. Another intercessor. Worship God, he says. Verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, there were some words earlier on that he said, don't tell anybody because it would give them a second chance, and it's too late for a second chance. Here, he said, don't seal it. I want everybody to know. I want everybody to know what's going on in heaven and their future in heaven. I want them to know the blessings. I want them to know the rewards. I want them to understand the penalty if they refuse it. For the time is at hand. 
Now, that was 2,000 years ago. But we're to live always as if Jesus is coming back right now. We should always, always wonder what would happen because he says, I'm coming in a hurry. And that if you're not ready, it's too late. Verse 11, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. That's not a wish. That is a declaration. When Jesus comes, there'll be no second chance. If he comes and you're found unjust, that's it. You will be unjust forever. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. If you are covered in sin, you will be covered forever. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Now, a really sad part of this is the word still also means more. Once we are separated, once some people are separated into hell, their sins will grow forever. In Genesis chapter 3, I, I just mentioned the curse, but let me read the end of it. It says, Then the Lord God said to an angel, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he take out his hand and take also of the tree of life and live and eat and live forever. Now, to my knowledge, this is the only place in the Bible where God speaks and doesn't finish his sentence. Most translations put a dash there. Now lest he take out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. God can't even finish that sentence. Because Adam in his sin, were he to live forever, his sins would increase forever. And that was a horror too great to, t to finish talking about. We see it on earth. People who get involved in a sin. And at first they know it's wrong, but after a while they justify it. Even trying to tell themselves it's good. Which leads them deeper into sin. After a while, they justify that. Each step along the way down, they normalize and feel like everything's okay until they step down again. Like the alcoholic who first just drinks a little too much and then drinks way too much. And each step of the way becomes normal to him. He doesn't feel he's gone overboard. No more than a fat man believes that eating a 2,000 calorie plate is that big a deal. We get used to our sin, and so we go worse and worse. Hell is the place where sin grows forever unchecked. One of the, one of the blessings of death is that we die before we get too far. Hell will be the place where, where sin will grow forever. The anger in your heart will grow and grow and grow if you don't know Jesus. You will spend eternity getting more and more sinful. We look at the demons and we forget that they were once angels. Sin corrupted the holy, one third of the angels corrupted them into the demons we talk about today. Hell's going to do that to, to the sinner as well. Those who are condemned to hell will grow in sinfulness forever. The horrible thing, Jesus is saying there's no second chance. Be right when I come back or else. On the other hand, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still more. We are justified and we are sanctified and we're not glorified until we reach heaven. But we will grow in righteousness, grow in holiness for eternity. Heaven's not a place where we go and remain stagnant. Heaven is going to be a place where we grow forever in the good things. That's kind of exciting. 
I'm going to be more and more like Jesus every moment. And the next moment I'll be more like Jesus for eternity. Never stopping because God is infinite. I can grow infinitely and never reach the glory of God. But I will reach for it over and over again for eternity. That's what's being said here. Yes, there is the harsh word I need to focus on. No second chances. When Jesus comes back, that's it. But what a glory we have to discuss as well. The idea that we're going to grow in holiness forever. Verse 12, behold, I am coming quickly. I'm coming in an instant. And my reward is with me. Remember, no second chance. He comes, boom. We're rewarded or punished. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I love how when God says something important, and every, of course everything's important, but when he says certain things of importance, he will emphasize them by declare, reminding you who he is. I'm God after all. I, I, I can see parents doing the same thing. When a mother tells her daughter something she doesn't want to hear, and then she'll say, I'm your mother. God, Jesus says, I am, the, I am the A and Z, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I am God Almighty, Jesus is saying. Verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments, who do the commandments of God. Jesus has said earlier, in the Gospels, if you love me, keep my word. Now we're told, blessed are those who, who keep his word, that they might have the right to the tree of life. We don't go to heaven as guests, even though most of us would be satisfied if we just got to slip in the back, back door and, and sleep in a, in a cardboard box in heaven. But no, we have the right to the tree of life. We live there. Like the college kid who comes home and immediately plunders the refrigerator. He didn't buy any of those groceries. But that's his home. He's been gone, but now he's back. It's his right. He's family. And that's where it is here. We have, they have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Don't have to slip in. We belong there. We live there. It's our home. But outside, now Jesus had described hell. One of the ways he described hell is to be cast out into the utter darkness, also translated outer darkness, where there's weeping and wailing of gnashing of teeth. In the city, there's no need for lamps because it's always daylight. But outside the walls is hell. There are no graduations of heaven and hell. No degrees. You're either with God or you're not. If you're with him, you abide in heaven. If you don't, you abide in hell. Outside are dogs. We're not talking about literal dogs here. It's not saying God's a cat person. But it's an insult to call a man a dog. Outside are the disgusting people, the dogs, and sorcerers. Remember, these were people who tried to work magic through chemistry. And we see them today in the form of drug dealers and sexually immoral, sexually filthy, and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. On one hand, that's a pretty good description of everybody. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But if this describes you, 
It will be too late one day, but it's not too late now for you to do something about it. You don't fix yourself. You can't. All you can do is come to Jesus and let him work in you the work of righteousness. And he will. But outside the Garden of Eden, outside the new heaven, the new Garden of Eden, is hell. You either belong to God or you don't. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. John, I sent the angel to tell you all this so you could tell the seven churches and through them the rest of the Christian world. We need to know, especially in the day of John, they needed to know when the Roman torture was going on. It was an inquisition against Christians. They needed to know, but we need to know that today. Christians suffer today. It's a mistake to think that because you live in America, you'll never be tortured. You'll never be persecuted. That could change in the drop at the drop of a hat. We need to know that God is going to win and that we will be with him when this is all over with. No matter how bad we win. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the beginning of the house of David and I am the ultimate output of it, outcome of it. Jesus is the last and greatest and eternal king of Israel, king of the people of God, the bright and morning star, the first star you see in the morning or the only star left and the bride and the spirit and the bride say, come and let hear, he who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. This invitation, because remember, it'll be too late one day. It's important to answer it now. Jesus could come back before this video is finished. You could be watching and before the last, the last part of it, Jesus can come back. He's coming suddenly. Verse 18. For I, it's a warning. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. People in that day would write apocalyptic literature. Remember, apocalyptic meant... Um, revelation, to reveal, the word apocalypsis, um, which we get the word apocalyptic from, means to uncover. So they would write books to uncover a spiritual truth. Many of those books, by the way, were fraudulent. Many of them made up the spiritual truth. It was a favorite book of the time. And they would steal from other neat books. There have been other religious leaders who have pretended to receive revelation from God while really they were just quoting other books and taking bits out of each book and putting it in theirs. Things that sounded holy just so their book would sound holy. A lot of fraudulent con men preachers and con men religious leaders have operated that way. And this word says anyone who adds to these words. 19, and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. Add or subtract from this book, and you will, be, you will have the, the punishment of sin added to you and the blessings of heaven removed from you. 
Now, some people have t said this means just Revelation, and other people have argued it means the entire Bible. Well, it's literally talking about this book, but I think the principle is true, that you don't change God's word. There are people today who'd like to rewrite it, make it fit their quote-unquote modern sensibilities. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of what we call modern today that is nothing more than old-fashioned paganism. There's no magic to 2020 or 2021, nor are things getting gradually better so that you can say that now is better than 50 years ago or 1,000 years ago. People are people. Time is time. And the Word of God is timeless. It never changes because God never changes. And we don't have a right to alter any of it. I say that because there will be always be people who try. And you and I oftentimes try by misquoting scripture so that we can misuse it. There are penalties for playing with the word of God. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says surely for the third time now, I am coming quickly. In other words, be ready. Amen. Now, the word amen is a Hebrew word, and it means that's right, that's the truth. In the King James Bible, when you hear Jesus say, verily, verily, I say unto you, the words verily, verily are literally in the Hebrew, amen, amen. So one of the meanings of amen is verily, or this is the truth. It also means, I agree. All the things you've heard people shout at the preacher in church when he's preaching, they'll say, amen, preacher, that's right, you preach it, is, is wrapped up in the word amen. So John says to all of this, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, even though with your coming comes sal salvation's opportunity lost. Even with your coming means the end of time and the end of opportunities. Even with your coming means hell for some people. Even so, come. We need you to come. We're at the end of our rope. And then he writes at the end of it, as a good, um, as a good closing, verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What a wonderful way to end this. He addressed the seven churches with detailed accusations, detailed compliments in some cases, and detailed means of repentance or consolation. Having dealt with those seven churches, he lined out they outline the trials and tribulations of living as a Christian in the Roman world and for us as well and then promise judgment and justice and then closes by reminding us of heaven and teaching us how wonderful but then that ex exhortation if you believe me repent now because I'm coming in a hurry. When I get here, it'll be too late. If you're found lost when I get here, Jesus says, you'll be lost forever. If you're found saved when I get here, you'll be saved forever. Are you right? Are you right with the Lord? Are you ready? Next week, we will begin another Bible study. Um, Frankly, Karen's trying to talk me into something, and we may very well do it. So I'll, I won't be able to announce it until next week. But it's still a work in progress. But as for now, in Christ's service and in yours, I am your pastor. Good night.